The Lion King, Walt Disney's animated film, became the highest grossing film of 1994 with over $900 million in revenue. It is also the best-selling film of home video systems, having sold over 40 million copies. In 2019, its new version was rated seventh in highest grossing animated films of all time, with over $1 billion in revenue. Just to compare, Harry Potter was rated 13th. What's in this movie that made it such a blockbuster? Indeed, it's got great music and beautiful animation. But many of Walt Disney's movies have the same. So what's in this particular movie that made millions of adults and youngsters watch it and buy it? To use the wisdom of the crowd, I posted a survey on Facebook and asked people, when you think of the movie Lion King, what is the first thing that you remember? Within half an hour, there were over 60 answers saying Mufasa's death. Simba, a young lion, loses his father Mufasa quite dramatically. Filled with guilt and self-blame, he runs away from his life duties. He meets two friends who accept him as he is and just walk beside him throughout his healing process. Then, he meets Rafiki, a spiritual mentor, who tells him that his father's spirit actually lives inside him, which helps him reconnect with his father and ultimately with himself. He then returns strengthened to face his real-life challenges. This is a story of facing adversity, of facing loss and overcoming it. I think the reason Lion King is such a great success is because it tells a story we all share, the circle of life. Carla Hayden, who selected this movie to be preserved in the US National Film Registry, explained that Lion King serves as a mirror of our collective experiences. But though death is an experience that will inevitably happen to all of us, we avoid talking about it to our children, wishing to protect them we don't mention the pain and sorrow inherent in life. We'd much rather tell them about the prince and princess living happily ever after. So I returned to Facebook and asked people, at what age did you first watch The Lion King? The average answer was five. Whether we like it or not, children are exposed to the concept of loss and death from a very early age. Yet studies show that 80% of teachers perceive death as a taboo topic. We spend 12 years in schools, yet the most important facts of life we end up learning on our own. In June 2006, exactly 15 years ago, I ended up learning on my own how to deal with loss. I was a young woman, nine months pregnant with my second child, when I went through a stillbirth which is the death of a fetus in late stages of pregnancy or during birth. It happened so suddenly and unexpectedly that I found myself completely overwhelmed. I found myself wondering, am I allowed to grieve? Was this a real baby? How do you grieve over someone you never really knew in the traditional way? I felt confused, shocked, and surprisingly guilty. Now, I was an adult when it happened. Just imagine what a child might go through. According to the Childhood Bereavement Estimation Model, one in 14 children in the US will experience the death of a loved one by the age of 18. That equates to more than 5 million school-age children in the US alone. And this is even without calculating the high COVID-19 mortality rates in the past year. The Harvard University Center on the Developing Child has found that grieving children are at risk of disrupted development, including mental health issues, decreased academic performance, impaired social relationships, reduced self-esteem, and even high mortality rates. But grief-related protective factors can help such as a caring community, peer support, and encouraging educators. Do students actually receive support? Are teachers well-trained to provide it? 
a report published in 2019, reviewed 20 years of research on bereaved students with a focus on support from schools. It indicated some disturbing findings. Bereaved students often said they were not provided with sufficient support from schools. For instance, Martin Littier's research, Voices That Want to Be Heard, described students' suggestions for improving the school bereavement response. One suggestion described students' needs for teacher support when they reconnect with their classmates after returning to schools. Another one mentioned the need for schools to see the loss as a life-changing event and the grief as something that does not simply disappear after a few months. As for teachers, studies indicate that they don't feel adequately qualified to deal with, with bereaved students. They wish to support the students, but feel unsure how to do so, are afraid of doing something wrong or saying something wrong and hurting them, and therefore many times say nothing. When teachers avoid talking to students about their loss, the result is that students are left to grieve on their own. A survey conducted by the American Federation of Teachers and the New York Life Foundation revealed that nearly 70% of teachers reported having at least one grieving student currently in their classroom whereas only 7% of them reported receiving any kind of bereavement training. About 90% of teachers reported the need to receive more training on how to support grieving students. The lack of formal teacher preparation has resulted in various organizations' initiatives to offer guidance, web resources, and toolkits to teachers. Organizations such as the New York Life Foundation and the National Center for School Crisis and Bereavement, which founded the Coalition to Support Grieving Students, and organizations such as Judy's House and Winston's Wish and many others. Yet I believe that formal institutional death education should be integrated into teacher training curricula in advance. A proactive approach would be much more effective than a reactive one. Some may say, you know what, we'll cross the bridge when we get to it. Well, Policymakers in education have decided to include issues such as ADHD and learning disabilities in the curricula, assuming the teachers will encounter these situations in the classroom. Why does the issue of death education has no room in teachers' curricula when we know that the risk of having a child, a bereaved child in the classroom, is no lower than having a child with ADHD? You may say, yeah, but that is not exactly the same because ADHD directly affects academic performance. So does grief. Grieving children are at risk of decreased academic performance and constantly report that their ability to concentrate is impaired, not due to any neurological organic causes in ADHD, but due to an emotional distraction. One may ask, why train teachers? Isn't that a job for school counselors or psychologists? Well, school counselors indeed provide invaluable first aid intervention in these cases. But teachers are the ones who continuously engage with students on a daily basis. So they are the ones better able to monitor and support students over the long run. As a result of my experience and after years of training, I became a psychologist, teacher educator, and bereavement researcher. My PhD focused on bereaved parents, and today I'm the head of a research lab, which is made up of people from many different backgrounds. As you can see here in this picture, we are religious, ultra-religious, and secular Jews. We're Arab Muslim and Bedouin, we're men and women. Over the years, I've had the chance to study a broad scope of loss experiences under various circumstances and among people of different backgrounds. I believe there are three things that are important for death-related education today. First, loss needs to be acknowledged. We have to make room for grief. When I first visited the cemetery where my stillborn baby is buried, I was amazed 
by a unique memorial area, including many walls like the ones you see in this picture. Walls on which texts and songs are written by parents to their beloved baby, mostly saying, I lost you, but you still exist in my heart. These parents needed to make a tangible memorial that would represent what they had gone through. In fact, this need for acknowledgement and memorialization is evident in any kind of lost circumstance I've ever explored and among people of different backgrounds. The second thing I learned is that this acknowledgement enables social support and social support matters. Six weeks after my son's stillbirth, I attended a friend's son's circumcision ceremony. It was excruciating, but I wasn't gonna ruin anyone else's party, so I didn't share my pain with anyone. It was quite a lonely experience. All of a sudden, my sister-in-law touched my shoulder and whispered, are you okay? This comment meant the world to me. I felt like she was saying to me, I can imagine your pain. I see you and I care. It was as if I had been carrying heavy luggage on my back when suddenly someone offered to help. Acknowledgement enables social support, not only because you can't support someone if you don't acknowledge the loss, but also because acknowledgement itself is part of supporting. And this leads me to my third and last point. Coping with grief and supporting a grieving person needs to be taught. When facing a new situation, all of us search for information. Knowledge can empower us, give us a sense of control and guide our behavior. So educating teachers about loss and grief will enable them to better support their students to acknowledge the loss and to provide them with essential information. It may also assist non-grieving students by enabling them to process their own feelings and thoughts arising from being exposed to the concept of death. Furthermore, teachers' explanation can help mediate the reconnection between the bereaved student and the peers, enabling the peers to better support the classmate. It's a win-win situation. Viktor Frankl, who survived the Holocaust, and founded Logotherapy once said, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. We can't change the fact that death happens, but we can change our mi mindset, and we can change the way we train teachers to respond. I call for re-evaluation of death education in the education system. Let's train teachers to become grief sensitive, and let's build grief-sensitive schools. One of the scenes from Lion King that I particularly remember is this. After Simba's insight, he says to Rafiki, his spiritual mentor, looks like the winds are changing. Rafiki replies, oh, change is good. Then Simba says, yeah, but it's not easy. True, nobody said it's going to be easy. But I'm certain that making this change of inserting death education into teacher training would be one that is definitely worth it. So, let the winds of change stop blowing. Thank you.